Nice Radio's Kalaloo presents Just Another Look. Just Another Look is an innovative, exciting, albeit decidedly provocative, and yes, yes, certainly controversial, socio-political analysis of issues of a local, regional, and international nature. Just Another Look is heard only on Nice Radio. First aired on Saturdays at 6 p.m. With repeat broadcasts on Sundays at 9 p.m. You can always catch us on the World Wide Web, www.niceradio.info. And you can check out our Just Another Look blog, www.justanotherlook.com. I am, of course, Keith Joseph. Today, dear friends, is Saturday. It is the fifth day of January 2019. It is actually our second program for 2019, the first having been done on New Year's Day the 1st of January, 2019. But welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of your favorite program, Just Another Look. In today's program, we want to take an in-depth look at the politics of St. Vincent and the Grenadines today. But as always, we know that if we are to deal with what exists today, we have to go back to see the antecedents. To learn from what existed before and to see how that has Changed and identify some of the common threads as well as the critical features that impacted whatever changes may have taken place. But before we get into this week's program, we want to ask our listeners. To find the time to get the ruling of Justice Asko Esco Henry, the judge who ruled on the case between the Public Service Union and the Public Service Commission in respect of five employees in the government's service. And we want you to look at that document to see what she had to say about the way in which these five persons were treated. We have been told that the system here is FAIR, F-A-I-R. But when one examines the judgment, one may recognize that there may well be a creation, the creation of a system of FAIR, F-E-A-R. And so you need to read that document. Because at the end of the day, you may very well arrive at the same conclusion that we have at just another look. 
which suggests that every member of the Public Service Commission should resign with immediate effect. More than that, it may very well point to the necessity of either retiring early some of the government officials or transferring them with immediate effect. We will deal with the judgment extensively in a subsequent program. But it is important in the meantime for our Vincentian people to read the ruling of Justice Esco Henry and to understand its significance because for how many years we've had the ULP leadership. An organization that claims that it is committed to genuine democracy. That it is committed to fair play. That it is committed to transparency. And that it exudes labor love. But when you go through the ruling of Justice Esco Henry in the case of these five government employees, you may very well find yourself asking, if this is labor love, do you want to be any part of it? Can you trust it? Because the Service Commission is all about honorable people. Placed there by the government. And one expected them to act fairly at all times. Free from bias, free from prejudice. But when you read the ruling, you're compelled to ask yourself, what then went wrong with these honorable people? And critical for us, you know, critical for us, is the fact that when the Public Service Union took to lawyer Dells and others, to act for and on behalf of the organization relative to these five employees who thought that they were overlooked from promotion within the system and that they were treated unfairly. The Service Commission dared to challenge the jurisdiction of the court over public servants and their complaints. They were arguing instead that before the public servants can take any matter further, they must go through the Services Commission. Well, when you read Jusco's Henry, Jusco Esco Henry's ruling, you have to be grateful that they won that wrong. Because what has been revealed, and the quote-unquote nonchalance on the part of some public officials, These are frightening facts. Frightening facts. And it does not exude any confidence in our system. So it is important that we all read that document in detail and understand how we operate in this system of governance because the leadership of the government appears to like to engage in chest thumping as to how well we are doing but when you read Justice Esco Henry's judgment 
we are not doing very well at all. But it is important that the Public Service Union bring to the fore very quickly all other such cases. That any public servant at any level reading the judgment and who feels that he or she has in fact been overlooked over a period of time. That others have simply come into the system and been catapulted over them while they languish for one reason or another, even without the requisite assessment being done. The report raises the question of assessment. And if assessments were not being done, how in God's name were the members of the Service Commission operating in terms of the promotion of officers within the system? And these are all honorable people. <laughs> all honorable people. And one can understand why they were not anxious for the court, or they may not have been anxious for the court to have declared that it had jurisdiction in dealing with the cases brought before them. Thank God that the court had jurisdiction. Because the plight of these five may not have been taken seriously by the people of this nation. And the minions may have been anxious to tell you they were lying. They made it up. But thank God that the court ruled that it did have jurisdiction in this particular matter. And in so doing, went on to rule in favor of these five. In some instances, declaring the action on the part of the employers and the representatives in the particular instances as even being virtually unlawful. Not just unfair, but in some instances, unlawful. And one wonders then, what were the commission members thinking? What were they thinking all along? But you're listening to just another look, so watch for it because we're going to deal with that in depth. Because every Vincentian has to understand how the system has been operating. And we have to be hopeful that when others bring their particular cases, that we may eventually get a change in the system. We may eventually get Vincentians to understand that the system has not been operating fairly. Some time ago, we talked about the so-called education revolution, and we said that was a non-entity. There's no such thing as an education revolution in this country. The evidence reflects that. There is no education revolution. It is a figment of somebody's imagination. What is amazing is how many people repeat that garbage. How many people go around the country? And it could well only be for political purposes that they keep repeating the same concept because it does not exist. There is no such phenomenon in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And you know that when you look at the performance of the system, 
we pointed out the significant flaws and deficiencies in the system under which we live. And we said that that in and of itself is the clearest reflection of the absence of any such phenomenon as an education revolution, the state of crime. Almost any type of crime that you could talk about. The behavior of some of the students in our schools, if they go to school at all, or if they play musical chairs with school. And when Justice Henry refers to the length of time that some of these people have not had any sort of evaluation at all. That, that's, our, that's, that's the so-called education revolution. Then we can have a system where the oversight body doesn't feel uncomfortable that we're not evaluating our employees for years on end and it doesn't seem to bother anybody that it has to be brought out in the nation's court for people to know that this exists and to believe that it exists or would some of the minions now go around and say oh they made that up <laughs> maybe the court system made it up thank god that things have unfolded the way they have done. Little by little, the chinks in the armor are being made public. But believe you me, the minions will find a way of justifying it and or of explaining it away. Because everybody who's critical, everybody who's critical of the existing system is then deemed to be almost an enemy and decried just about everywhere but we will deal with that you're listening to just another look so the politics of St. Vincent and the Grenadines today You know, there was a time in the Caribbean, there's a time in the Caribbean, during, and more particularly in the aftermath of the Black Power Movement, when we saw the emergence or the mushrooming of left-wing political parties in almost every one of the islands. And for those who don't know, the Black Power Movement actually came to a, a head in, 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 in the 1970s. A Trini American, well, Stokely Carmichael, was instrumental in pulling up the ideas of a number of people from all over the place and wrapping it up in the concept of black power. And you had a, a series of, of cultural features that accompanied that. The music, Say It Loud from James Brown, Say It Loud, I'm Black and Proud. The clenched fist of raised. And then black became a symbol of the black people's desire for power. The ideas of W.E. Du Bois, Du Bois, of Marcus Mosiah Garvey. They moved beyond the concept of negritude from Amy Césaire in Martinique, who was a student along with a number of others, Leopold Senghor and others, the students of Jean-Paul Sartre in France. And they coined the concept of negritude, the embodiment 
of what they saw as the best qualities of black people, of the black man and black woman. So we had this wave called black power. People sporting Afros and Dashikis, identifying with the African motherland. That was a, a period in history. It was a wave. And as we go through this program, you'll see that things happen in waves. And that's why we have to be concerned as to what is happening globally. The resurgence of racism. It's as if colonialism never really ended. The wave for nationalism. In the midst of that wave of, a, of racism. So the black power wave swept across the world. And black people were made to come to an understanding that they were no less human than anybody else living on this earth. They felt that they ought to be. They had a right to be just as any other man or woman in the world. And during that period, there's a lot of turmoil because they were so angered by their understanding of their own history. And how, as Rod, Walter Rodney defined it in his book, how Europe underdeveloped Africa became a symbol of how Europe underdeveloped much of us, much of the countries that they conquered and colonized. And how enslaved people were transported to different parts of the world, to this Caribbean of ours, scattered across the different islands, and to the United States, to allow European powers to enrich themselves off of the systematic exploitation of other lands and peoples. And in that period, things changed rapidly. The whites suddenly recognized we need to, to recognize these people. We need to acknowledge their existence. And they made changes, largely strategic changes, that allowed them to continue their hegemonic dominance and control of much of the wealth of the world. But to open up some up opportunities That is why the international black community, the African diaspora, was so enthused when they saw a Barack Obama, a black man, African heritage, ascending to the presidency of the United States of America. Oh yes, we in the Caribbean, we got black leaders before the United States. But many of them appeared not to have understood the concept of negritude or what it meant as a black person to have ascended into positions of power. And you remember, of course, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 
where we did have some black leaders. Remember Larry Bascom in the wheelchair? Chiding us for what we have done. And reminding us during his time here on earth that it was time for a black man to lead the country. And he knew why he was saying that. But we tend not to apply our critical thinking skills to what is happening around us. But the experience of black power, that wave that gave rise to a certain amount of black consciousness, across the African diaspora did impact the Caribbean however minuscule but we've reached a point in our history where people don't want to talk about that just as we don't want to talk about slavery we don't want to talk about the black power period the minute you raise that they say the black people who are raising that are themselves racists <laughs> but in the aftermath of that period we had this wave this rise of the left in the Caribbean in almost every one of our Caribbean islands we had the emergence of left-wing political parties led by some who profess to be ideologues and they oriented themselves essentially along Marxist Leninist political ideological lines they were keen to associate their thinking with the ideas of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels in the Communist Manifesto and of the changes to that ideological position brought on by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin as he rose to prominence in what later became the Soviet Union. So, interestingly, the cell style ideologues, ideologues that led these left wing political parties that dotted the Caribbean landscape, were themselves grappling with the ideologies that they were projecting. And there were clashes between them. and those who were leaders of the black power movement. Across the region, because you see, the left, the Marxist-Leninist-oriented thinkers felt that they were superior intellectually and they used their academic background to justify that superiority, that ideological superiority. And because the black power people linked themselves to the concept of negritude, I made references to the writings in the case of the Caribbean, to the writings of Franz Fanon. Red shirt of the earth, black skin, white mask. They belittled him and his writings and his thinking because he was a psychologist. And psychology was not a science as far as they were concerned. But Marxism, Leninism, seen as a scientific oriented ideological position. 
and set of ideas. So they saw themselves as superior. Unlike Lenin, they attempted across the region to suggest, and these were, many of them were middle class people, that their intellectual understanding of how life should be was superior to that of any other. And that the working class should lead the struggle. Even though, by definition, they were no longer working class. It's interesting because they were saying the leader class, working class should lead. But any working class person, genuine working class person that aspired to the leadership found themselves belittled and humiliated because you're not bright enough. <laughs> so the leaders of the left in many of our Caribbean countries were at the time of their leadership of the left decidedly middle class. <laughs> that, that was the conundrum that characterized this Caribbean of ours and also impacted us here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So even as they grappled with understanding the very Marxist-Leninist ideology that they adopted and how they should be applied to the politics of the region, they were selling it to the Caribbean public. Some would suggest it all occurred as part of a phase and a wave in the politics of this Caribbean of ours. So we've always had waves in Caribbean politics. Because just as over a period of time, slavery virtually consumed us all, then emancipation, then indentureship, waves, waves. So too, in the 1930s, we had the wave of labor struggles reaching to a head with the respective colonial administrators, eventually leading to riots in one Caribbean island after another, as though all systematically planned, in a period when there were significant challenges to communications between the islands. One island after another erupted. In the 1950s, we had the wave led by Theophilus Albert Marichaud of Grenada towards the importance and the necessity of a West Indies Federation. And then after that, the wave in the 1960s through to the 80s towards independence among almost all of our nations. So we've had waves. The Black Power wave in the early 1970s. And while that existed and immediately afterwards, Rastafarianism gained greater recognition. But then there was also the pro-Marxist Leninism, Marxism Leninism wave. In each wave, each wave may have led to some sort of progress. Certainly it led to some changes, but some sort of progress but not enough to sustain a consistent drive for genuine development in the different islands. For the 400 years of slavery and the colonization of our people, 
the systematic transformation of our people, the liberate transformation of our people by the colonial regimes. Left that legacy of dependence from which we could not extricate and sometimes still cannot fully extricate ourselves. So we did not have a significant enough sustainable drive towards development. Oh yes, we made changes, but not enough progress. We replaced the white leaders of government, the people of color, black people in some instances. But there remained a fundamental belief among black people that they were somehow deficient and inferior and that the way to rule was to behave in the same authoritarian manner as the former leaders. I was their model and for many still the model. But there was still this belief in their own inferiority such that the electorate still by and large remained essentially oriented towards a sort of incipient belief that ultimately we should be ruled by people of the fairer complexion, of the lighter hue. It remains most difficult to understand their friends. That a group of small islands, albeit varying in physical and population sizes, cannot to this day come to an appreciation that their best development options, individually and collectively, their best development options individually and collectively lie in their forging of a legal union that is binding and which has in place appropriate sanctions for deviation from their agreed principles and practices. It is amazing. And we do not yet seem to understand that. A review of the different waves or phases in the emergence of the Caribbean into the independent nation that we are today would reveal the extent to which we have always been victims of the incredible egos of those who have risen to positions of leadership. It is perhaps best manifested in their own characterization of ascension to positions of leadership with ascensions into positions of power. The best manifestation and the clearest manifestation of this reality is the ease with which we claim that we are in power. Glenn Jackson was the best example of trying to convince the nation that the ULP had not just gone into a position of government, it went into a position of power. Of power. And perhaps that's what we saw in the performance of the Public Service Commission. Maybe they all felt they had power, the commissioners. And because they had power, they could have behaved as they did. Maybe. But when we look at the different phases and waves, of Caribbean politics. 
We know that those who have not taken the vicious high road in Caribbean politics have been labeled weak. Those who have not enriched themselves during their tenure in political office are deemed weak and stupid. Incidentally, some have died particularly poor. And they were castigated for having been in power and not recognizing that they should have emerged enriched. <laughs> in most of our Caribbean countries, those who have ascended to the positions of political power often leave politics enriched. With an abundance of financial resources that cannot be accounted for by the salaries that they would have gotten while in power. So we have this belief that if you're in politics, you should become enriched. And you see it happening all around you. <laughs> Compare what they acquire during their tenures in office with the salaries that should legitimately be given to them. We are always mindful, you know, of when Lyndon Pinlin wanted to prove to the, Jama the Bahamian people that he was not corrupt. He asked for an inquiry into himself. And of course, the inquiry concluded they found no evidence of wrongdoing. But one of the members of the inquiry, an Anglican bishop, Drexel Gomez, asked leave to publish a minority report in which he felt duty-bound to inform the nation that while indeed there was no evidence of wrongdoing, there were finances owned by Lyndon Pindlin that could not be accounted for by his legitimate earnings as Prime Minister of the Bahamas. So while he couldn't prove that he did anything wrong to get those extra finances, they couldn't explain where those extra finances came from. So, <laughs> we behave as our colonial masters. And many believe that the people are fooled. But what the people have learned is that this is the model. Go in poor and come out rich. Go, it, you know, it's one of the reasons why Just Another Look always insists. One of the critical features of the ULP manifesto in 2001 was to introduce integrity legislation. Integrity legislation suggests that everybody going into office must declare all of their assets. And during their tenure in office, declare where all their assets and resources come from on a regular basis. It, integrity legislation, if done properly, essentially allows for a level of accountability and transparency of all public officials. But Vincent Beach told us that they 
the ULP had brought such a legislation to the House. And as we quote him, but they didn't want it. And he went on, but I promise you, and I promise you, that within the first 100 days in office, a ULP government will introduce integrity legislation. Of course, if you brought a piece before, it's easy to lift it from under the dust and do it. But in the near 18 years that the ULP has been in office, the NDP brought a much more comprehensive document as a test piece to lay in the house. It is still laying in the house, perhaps by this time under the house. <laughs> So, we suggest that Caribbean politicians have often prayed on the fact, P-R-E-Y-E-D, prayed on the fact, that despite their avowed commitment to education, their perception of the masses, their perception of the treasured electorate, remains one that defines the voting majority as inadequately educated at best, such that their votes can easily be bought. It is the reason that during election time you find envelopes of money being thrown under people's doors. It is the reason that we talk about rum and bully beef politics in Jamaica, rum and roti politics in Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we could talk about parties, entertainers.